Hello, sci-fi and pop culture fans. My name is Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. You've been listening to So You Had to Build a Time Machine by Jason Offit, which was a finalist in the science fiction category for the 2020 Best Book Awards and was named one of the top 100 indie books for 2020 by Shelf Unbound. Today, we have Jason Offit here for a virtual interview, and I'm so excited to talk to him about his book. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me uh, having me on. I'm really, really excited about this. Of course. Yeah, really excited to get into your book. This is a really fun one to read. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? All right. Uh, yes. Um, my name is Jason Offit. I, uh, right now, uh, well, for the past 17 years, uh, I've taught journalism at uh, Northwest Missouri State University. Uh, before that, I was a, uh, I was a newspaper uh, editor and reporter. And uh, before that, I uh, grew up on a farm and decided I didn't like to smell like hog manure. So <laughs> let's go to college and do something else. Uh, I've been I've wanted to be a novelist uh, ever since I was 10 years old. And I told my parents that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. And they, you know, mussed my hair and said, that's adorable. And, <laughs> and uh, I went and did it. <laughs> so, yeah, follow those dreams, folks. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So we're here, obviously, to talk about So You Had to Build a Time Machine. But uh, you also have another book called Girl in the Corn, which are two very different genres. And you said you went to school for journalism. So what made you choose specifically for this one, um, the sci-fi genre to focus on? Well, I, I grew up a nerd. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge nerd. I, uh, one of the first TV shows I latched on to, and it was on at the same time as uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So I didn't watch Mr. Rogers as a kid. I watched the original Lost in Space on reruns. Ooh, and yeah. then I found Star Trek, the original show, and fell in love, uh, fell in love with that show. And I got hooked into uh, science fiction and, uh, uh, and horror movies. Uh, uh, and I also, the first book series I read when I was, gosh, what was I, 10 when I read, uh, The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. So I've been in the, in the, in the science fiction, horror, horror, fantasy genres, uh, as long as I've been, uh, been, uh, absorbing pop culture. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Those are some of my favorite shows to watch with my dad growing mm -hmm. up too. So that's really cool. And really... Uh, you got a good parent. Yeah. Good for him. <laughs> Thanks. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so, I mean, this one you said, you had said that you are all about the sci-fi genre, science fiction, uh, horror, fantasy. So what made you choose this particular topic for this book? What was your inspiration to have a bunch of characters just getting thrown through time and space? Well, I've always loved time travel stories. Uh, I remember as, as, as a kid, uh, we had an independent, independent TV station and from Friday night until basically Saturday, early Sunday morning, uh, they showed old science fiction movies or horror, old horror movies. And I was glued to the tube. And I remember <laughs> watching uh, the, the Time Machine, H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, the one that came out in 1960. And that really, really got to me. I'm like, that would be so cool. And then uh, there were so many Star Trek uh, time travel episodes and then, I, you know, other movies. And I've just always been fascinated by that. And when I got older and there were more, there was more exploration into different dimensions, um, parallel that were just like ours, but maybe a little bit not. Sure. Um, that really got my attention even more. So I decided to put the two together and see what sort of absolute madness I could come up with. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this book was a wild ride. It was so fun to read. <laughs> so, okay. You've got some in addition to all of the craziness that's going on, you've got some really colorful characters too. I really, you know, I was telling you earlier, Brick was one of my favorites. And um, what, first of all, why name your characters these kind of obscure names? And then what was your inspiration for each of these characters? Because they were all uniquely flawed and but had very deep backstories. So it was really cool. I felt very connected to all of them as I was reading. Right. Well, I mean, growing, I mean, high school, college, I mean, we didn't generally go by our names. We all had different names. In college, I had a buddy named Meathead. 
<laughs> that's what he wanted to be called. So that's that's what we called him. His roommate was Funky Rick. And you know, we, we had just different <laughs> names. And I'm like, that's what people do. They come up with names for each other. Um, so yeah, the two main characters, Skid and uh, and 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 Brick, have have these odd nicknames. Uh, I mean, there was there are reasons for them. I mean, Skid had a motorcycle wreck, and she went sure. skidding. Yeah. And Brick, Brick, before he uh, decided to follow his passion and open his own muffin shop, uh, was a bricklayer. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. It was really fun because they were just very out of the ordinary names that we got to really associate with the characters. I feel like when characters have the same names as everyone else, not that it's a bad thing, but every once in a while I'll get all of the names mixed up. Like, oh, when I'm thinking of this character, it kind of meshes with this character that has the same name. And so it's fun to have something that distinguishes them a little bit better. Right. Well, and I gave, um, I, especially Brick, I gave him a, a good reason to want to be called Brick because sure. we've got this big, beefy uh bearded guy uh and his first name's chauncey yeah <laughs> so yeah he'd rather go by brick so the, the, the name the names kind of fit sure. the the inspiration um wow i just, i wanted to have i wanted to write a, a novel uh where the main character was a strong female character uh my other novels have, have been men and i know how to write about them because i've always been one <laughs> so guys I can handle, but women, uh, no. And, and I've got three daughters. So, you know, I want that strong female character. And I wanted her to have a diverse set of skills, like knife throwing and trick motorcycle riding and things of that nature, uh, how to get out of handcuffs. And I'm like, where could somebody learn all this stuff if they were raised in a circus? <laughs> they would, of course, learn all that stuff. So... Um, that's where I came up with, with the idea for, for Skid. Uh, I actually based her, um, her, her, her tough nose, nonsense, no nonsense, uh, personality, uh, on, on my oldest sister, uh, who, who passed away before the book came up Her book, the book was published. Um, but I've always loved people that will tell you something honestly, especially yeah. if it's blunt. And, and I, I wanted her to be that person. And yeah, to make sure I got a, a female character right, uh, all of my beta readers, except for one, uh, were women. Because oh, I didn't want to get anything wrong. I wanted no stereotypes. I wanted to have a real leave, li uh, living, breathing person. Um, and and I, I hope I accomplished that. Yeah, well, I am very particular about those things personally. I have seen so many books where it's just like, oh, the female lead is just a little ditzy and we're all kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And it, for someone who feels a little bit like there's just more nuance to me as a person and to females in general, mm -hmm. it was really nice to read something that felt, I, I felt very seen reading your book. So thank you for that. And I well, see the work that you put into it. So thank you. That was really cool. I, I appreciate that. Yes. And yeah, yeah. She's not the, the, she's not a stereotype. She's not going to, to run from the monster or the villain, villain and fall down because she's wearing high heels. Like, right. you know, that happens in every movie. She's not, well, she's not going to wear high heels for one thing. No, and she's two, got her Hello She's not running sneakers. from danger. She's running into, yeah, she's got Hello Kitty sneakers <laughs> and she's running into danger, not away from it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Brick, I, I, you know, I, I always loved gentle giant characters. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the guy from the brawny uh, paper towel packaging. All right, we got this That's big exactly hairy lumberjack guy. Yeah, big hairy lumberjack guy who he makes muffins and he plays Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> and he quotes Lord of the Rings and Star Trek. I mean, that's I'm as I, as I established earlier on. I'm I'm a I'm a nerd. Uh, I'm a Dungeons and Dragons playing nerd. I could reach over. Oh, what do I have? Nope, I don't have my D&D books, but <laughs> I've got my collection of Star Wars books that I collected when I was a kid. Oh, amazing. So, <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, I wanted to have that nerdy person in the body of a linebacker. Um, because that's not expected in right. today's, you know, in media. Um, uh, Cord uh, Cordry Bellamy. Uh, I actually knew a man named Cordry. Okay. So that's an actual guy's name. It's just odd. <laughs> and uh, 
he's he's a shyster. Uh, he's just looking for a a, a quick buck. Um, well, I, see if all these people are different that I'm throwing in here, and and uh, Bud Light Dave, the yes. uh, uh, theoretical fitness physicist, um, is a smart smart aleck, and and he's a bit of an alcoholic. But uh, <laughs> I, I tried to make him not stereotypical of your um, you know you know science smock wearing uh, you know scientist. Sure. So I just, yeah, I wanted to, to have a completely diverse set of characters and, and not what the reader expects. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. That's really cool. It's actually funny you say that because in the first chapter when Bud Light Dave is introducing himself to Skid and he says that he's a theoretical physicist or a scientist mm -hmm. or whatever his title is that he announces himself to her. In my head, I'm like, that's just a pickup line. You know, he's not actually mm -hmm. this this person he's portraying himself to be. And then of course you find out through the story, Oh, that actually is him. And he's mm -hmm. actually very intelligent and has a very logical thought process. In addition to being a little bit of an alcoholic. And I really appreciated that about all of your characters. They just felt very real and that they all had very complex personalities and skill sets. And like you said, it was just really cool to see all of the work that went into each character's development. Yeah, I, and that's whenever I read um, plot to me is secondary. I, I I have to have characters I like or hate one of the two. I don't want to be indifferent toward a character. If I have a villain, I want to hate hate him. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> right, right. And because if I don't feel dislike for a villain, you know, I'm what what's the point? You know, and if sure. I don't love the protagonist. Yeah, I, I'm not going to want to finish the book. So I wanted uh, characters to be as real and and relatable as I could. Yeah. And you had mentioned earlier, I can't remember if we caught it on recording or not, but that you had written other stories about time machines and science fiction-y things. Do they at all follow any sort of suit with So You Had to Build a Time Machine, or are they completely different? Oh, the uh, yeah, the, the the stories I wrote about time machines. Uh, I wrote uh, uh, five, and this is over a number of years. Five different nonfiction paranormal books that revolved around ghosts and and UFOs and Bigfoot. You know, pe people who've who've uh, encountered these things. And and two of my favorite stories are uh, time machine stories of people who claim to have actually invented time machines. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I um, I. I Based a little off them, but they were kind of off their rockers, but they're, they're still <laughs> fun stories. The, the only other time machine I wrote uh, wrote about in, in a novel was in my first novel called A Funeral Story. And uh, the, the, the main character's dad uh, was a scientist and tried to build a time machine and uh, then disappeared. Oh, wow. Um, he, he didn't go through time. I'm just throwing a spoiler <laughs> out there. Something else happened, but... <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I, I, I might write time, uh, time travel again because I love the topic so much. Sure. No, it's really neat. And I really like how in the book it had a lot of modern implications, like everything that changed around them always either snapped back into place or obviously was due to something that had changed in the past. Um, so on the topic of... Uh, the nonfiction people that you base your time machine, time travel mm -hmm. things off of. We were talking a little bit earlier about how you do have a time machine that you purchased from someone who claimed it was a functioning time machine. What can you tell us about right. that? Oh yeah, you you bet. Uh, uh, at teaching at the university, uh, uh, I you know it's really cool. Even though I'm in the I, I'm in the mass media department and I teach journalism, um, I've got friends in other departments, and two of those friends are literal scientists they are <laughs> they're doctors they're professors they and uh, so um they got a hold of me and and said jason let's you know this one time machine you wrote about let's um let's see if we can buy one and the time machine uh is sold or at least it was back back in 2009 by, by a man who claimed on many paranormal radio programs that himself from a different dimension came to him and gave him the plans for the machine and uh. he built it and then started selling it over the internet. And that's, uh, that's, we got, we got grant money for it and we bought it and, and we played with it. And, uh, the, the directions say, uh, it takes three minutes for the time machine to work. 
And what I found is the time machine does work. It wastes three minutes of your life. <laughs> That's fair. So is this person who sold you the time machine the inspiration for any of these stories you've written? No, no, not, not at all. <laughs> not at all. That's really funny. Yeah, I tried when it when it comes. I I I told you my uh, my uh, character Skid was based on my sister. Yeah. I try not to base people on other people sure. or things that other people have done, just because of the fact that um, I I don't want. I, I, that's why I haven't written my memoirs yet. I don't want anybody <laughs> to get upset with me sure. and sue me. So yeah, this is all uh, right out of the noggin. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but you said that you do draw, you know, a little bit of inspiration from people around you. And your story is based in your hometown, right? Kansas City. Um, so right. what other things, you know, what in what ways did you bring Kansas City to your story? In what other ways did you draw inspiration from your life and the things around you to inform your book? Well, um, yeah, most of, uh, you know, the places that I mentioned in Kansas City are there. Uh, the story also goes down to Peculiar, Missouri, which is an actual town, and it's named oh, wow. Peculiar. <laughs> and, um, you know, going to Peculiar, uh, whenever I say that, you know, the this Sonic Drive-In's on this street, and this Casey's Convenience Store's on this street, all of that's right. And I even, uh, in one of the reviews, uh, uh, a, a woman uh, in New York, a, a reviewer, an online reviewer, uh, loved the book, and she said, my husband is from Peculiar, Missouri. And he said, I know where that is. I know where that is. I know where that is. Oh, that's so, so great. So that made me feel great that, yeah, I nailed I nailed everything with, with, with my descriptions. As, as a matter of fact, this one restaurant I mentioned, I even made sure that I got Wing and Night on the right evening. Oh, wow. I didn't want to say Wing Night was on a Tuesday when it's on a Thursday. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. No, that's really cool. And that's so important. There was another one of our books that was based in my hometown. And I remember reading it thinking, oh my gosh, this is the perfect picture of the place that I grew up. And we actually just talked to him. It was James Lynn Holmes book. And, um, right. yeah. And he is in Monterey now, which is where I grew up. So it was really fun to talk to him about mm -hmm. like, oh, you mentioned this place. I used to go to that place every Wednesday after mm -hmm. school. And that was really fun. So I'm sure for the people See, who I didn't, Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, I, well, no, I just wanted to say that, I, yeah, I didn't want to take any liberties with with locations and just make something up. Sure. Because uh, when I was working in, in the newspaper uh, industry, uh, we have a reporter. She was from uh, Hiawatha, Kansas. Mm -hmm. And she got, uh, we got a book in that, it was, a, it was a novel based in Hiawatha. And she, she was excited. I got to read this. It's based in my hometown. I've got to write a review of it. And she was so upset, so dis disillusioned because she said, obviously this the, the guy who wrote the book had never been to Hiawatha. So uh -huh. he got all of the details wrong. I, I didn't want to be that guy. Sure. You know, having been a journalist for 17 years and I I teach have taught journalism for 17 years on top of that. Wow. I like to be correct. <laughs> I got, my <laughs> facts have to be be right there. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, again, as someone who has read a really lovely depiction of my hometown, I really appreciated it. I really appreciate mm -hmm. when someone takes the time to make that extra effort to really know what they're talking about. So I can only imagine the person who is from Peculiar seeing the accurate ways that you describe their hometown mm -hmm. and being so excited. Um, right. Even if it's even if it's fiction. If the reader knows you've got a fact wrong, they're going to stop trusting you. And you never want to lose your reader's trust. That's totally fair. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so to shift gears just a little bit, because I am really curious about this next part. You've got a lot going on in this book. You've got a lot of different characters jumping to different times and dimensions and how did you keep track of where everyone was and how they were all going to end up back together in the end? And also even just what was your writing process like in deciding you were going to have everyone all over the place at once? I thought it would be fun to have everybody all over the place at once. I, I also thought it would be really fun, not just for the reader to read, but uh, one of the things that got me into writing is it's fun to create. Sure. I love putting, you know, creating these people, making them real, and then throwing them in these insane situations. What, um, what my process is, I'm a pantser, 
Uh, you got plotters and pantsers. The plotters write out an outline, and they follow that outline. I, I can't do that. Okay. I am, I'm not organized that way, and I like to create characters, and I don't even, I don't, my characters are not in-depth when I come up with them. They become in-depth as I write. They grow in front of me, as does what happens. So I had no clue how this was going to end. Sure. I had no clue where I was going from chapter to chapter, and I didn't have you know, a wall of notes with red, you know, red lines connecting everything. Um, I just, just kept it in my head and it all came together at the end. Yeah. Well, it was really cool because one thing I really appreciate about stories is when they give you little clues throughout the story to figure out how it's going to end. And you really have to pay attention in that case, but that's what makes it so fun is you're like, ah, that's a callback to this moment. And obviously the ending of the book was the ultimate callback to everything that had happened. And I don't want to spoil anything, but it was really just one of those aha moments where you're like, oh, now it all clicks into place. And I thought that was another thing that just made your book so fun to read was having this culmination of, oh, that this makes sense, uh, even with all of the chaos. So it made it really, just really fun for me as someone who really appreciates that kind of writing style uh, to, to see so, it all yeah, come together. With with this one uh, in, in particular, now I, one of my other favorite TV shows growing up, and heck, I still watch it today, is the original Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. And Rod Serling did that. He kind of hinted at things and at the end was this big ending and you're like, oh my gosh, but there were little breadcrumbs the whole way. Uh, he, he wrote the screenplay for the original Planet of the Apes movie, the 1968. You know, so at the end, there were, I mean, throughout the movie, there were these little bitty breadcrumbs, but at the very end, you've got Charlton Heston looking up and there's the, the uh, Statue of Liberty buried half in the sand and he's like, no! And he realized <laughs> that he was on Earth the whole time. Right. By the way, folks, this movie came out in 1968. That is not a spoiler. <laughs> so, but but yeah, I I absolutely love um, love stories that that ended like that. I, the The Sixth Sense, which is uh, M Night Shyamalan's you know best movie in my opinion. At the very end, when we find the end out, I'm like, wait a second. Okay, everything else that I saw throughout the movie makes sense now. Absolutely. So I, I appreciate you saying that because. <laughs> Uh, I wanted, I wanted that, I wanted that to happen. Yeah. You paid extra attention to that detail. It seems like on Mm. purpose, which is again, very cool. And yes, I, so I have not seen the sixth sense, but I know how it ends because everybody knows how it ends. It's it's not, it's, uh, one of Hollywood's worst kept secrets, I would say. Um, but it came out in 99. So no, it's not, right. Exactly. It's not a spoiler. (laughs) It's not surprising. You know, I, at this point I should have seen it, but I, Knowing how it's going to end, I feel like when I when I do end up watching the movie, I'll be able to kind of, oh, wait, ah, that leads to that. And, oh, that makes sense because I know that this is how it's going to end. And I feel like some of my favorite books to read, including yours, is now that I know how it ends after reading it, when I go back and read it later, because I know I will, I'll be able to find even more little hints along the way as to how it leads to this conclusion. So... I'm excited to go back and read it again and see all of the little uh, Easter eggs, if you will, that you plant along the way. <laughs> all right, awesome. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, and yeah, the the, the Sixth Sense, I, I watched it twice in a row in the theater, two days in a row, because the first time, I mean, it blew me away at the end. Oh, my gosh. And then I watched it again, and, and I did. I mean, all the, the, the hints that were dropped, I'm like, why didn't I notice that? Why didn't I notice that? But, you know, sure. I wasn't in the mind frame to notice it. So yeah, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Well, yeah, I think that's what makes it really cool too, is you see all of the hints along the way, but you're so focused on the story and you're so enthralled by what's happening, playing out in front of you that you just, you, you kind of file it away in the back of your mind, but you don't even think about it until later. Like, Oh, now I can see where they were going with this. Uh, and that, yeah, I think Again, you did that so well here, and I'm sure that that is what was super exciting about The Sixth Sense for you as well. Uh, Yeah, thanks. (laughs) Okay, so I have this question that I ask all of our authors who we have here on the podcast. What are you reading right now? 
Oh, I've got a couple of uh, books. My son wants me to read <laughs> read read one of one of his books, so that that's going to come up. Uh, <laughs> I'm reading uh, uh, the complete works of A. A. Milne, the Winnie the Pooh books uh, for my seven year old, mm -hmm. and for me, um, I just oh, I just finished. Gosh, it's le it's leaving me. I just finished. I don't remember, but I will take a step. God, I just got finished reading it. I'll <laughs> take a step it. back. One of those things right at the tip of your tongue. Yeah, and it's just, <laughs> out. but I will take a, a step back to the book I read before the last one I can't remember is Jordan Bartlett's uh, Contest of Queens. Yes, I think Which is up here. on the shelf yeah. right, right there. <laughs> and it was terrific. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That one's been, I'm really excited. That one's coming up in our list as well. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to read that one too. Um, so you said your son rec recommended you a book, or is he a writer as well? No, no, no. He's uh, he's in school. He's he he's he wants to be a game designer. Oh, so very he, cool. He does put stories together, uh, but that's that's his medium. Wow. Okay. Very cool. So just a recommendation then from him that is on your radar. Right. Right. It's a. Uh, uh, Actually, it's a middle grade, a middle grade book, maybe young, young adult, uh, The Last Kids on Earth. Okay. And it's pretty funny so far. Oh, awesome. Very cool. Um, so I have a question for you, just for you personally, because Brick is a big D&D &D fan, and I know you are a big D&D &D player. Um, if you could choose your stats, what would you choose for yourself? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm going... In, in intelligence first, I'm going to, I'm, sure. I'm going, uh, somewhere in the teens, um, uh, in charisma. I'm going to go next. I'm going to put it also in the teens because you know, everybody loves a smart ass, right? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, wisdom, you know, probably around seven or eight. <laughs> that, that one always escapes me. And you know, uh, uh, the rest of them, uh, strength and constitution, probably somewhere normal, below normal. Dexterity is <laughs> going to be my worst category, uh, my first worst skill, because I can trip walking across the flat floor with nothing <laughs> on it. So dexterity is the lowest. You know what? That's fair. I don't think you're alone in that one either. So <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we wrap this up, I know you have on your shelf, you've got... Uh, your two books, so you had to build a time machine and the girl in the corn, and we've got girl in the corn on our shelf as well. As so, you had to build a time machine. What can you tell us about the girl in the corn? If you uh, love, so you had to build a time machine and are expecting something just like it, you're not getting it. Uh, <laughs> whereas, so you had to build a time machine was a uh, was was a humorous science fiction story. Uh, the Girl in the Corn is a straight-out uh, dark fantasy horror story. Uh, there's gore in it. There's some disturbing scenes. And, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's dark. It's dark. There's really not a lot of humor in it at all. The, the little bit of humor that's in it is just, you know, everyday conversations that normal people have. Um, but it's pretty fun and fast-paced. And, and I, based, uh, I, I based it on... Uh, in the interviews that I had done when I was writing uh, nonfiction paranormal, I, I interviewed people who claim to have uh, encountered the Fae, which, you know, elves, fairies, that sort of thing. <laughs> they claim to have encountered and had, you know, relationships with them. And uh, the fairies uh, are not, fairies in lore are not at all what they're like in, in, in Disney. Mm. Hey, they're not all happy and smiles and they're friendly. They're, they're pretty dark and, and wicked. And, and, and that's what we get with the girl in the corn. Sure. Wow. It's, it's gotten a lot of great, uh, great reviews and, and the audio book version won uh, the independent book publishers associations, a uh, gold Benjamin Franklin award. Oh, amazing. So uh, it's, and it's gotten a, a ton of great reviews. So if you're a fan of horror there, there we go. The girl in the corn, I'm writing the sequel to the girl in the corn right now not right now but <laughs> in this time frame yeah right wow well that's very cool very exciting i'm excited to have you back to talk about the girl in the corn um we have it on the schedule at some point but i'm really excited to have you back and talk more about that one because 
Har always gives me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies, but I, yeah. it seems like when something is really well written, especially in the fantasy realm, it's always something that catches my interest for sure. The key is to uh, I, I don't I don't care what kind of monster it is. I don't <laughs> care uh, how evil it is. I it's everything's got to be real. Sure. Every good thing's got to seem real. So I, I think I did a nice job in that. Oh, well, I'm really looking forward to reading that and then chatting with you about it later. Oh, I had a great time. Thank you so much. And I can't wait to come back on to, to discuss The Girl in the Corn. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Is, where can we find you? What's your social media handles? What about your website? What can you share with us? Okay. Uh, yeah, my, my uh, website is uh, jasonoffit.com. J-A-S-O-N-O-F-F-U-T-T. Uh, I'm the Jason Offit on uh, Instagram and Twitter. And oh, on Facebook, I'm either author Jason Offit or Jason Offit author. I can't remember. Sure, yeah. <laughs> but I'm the, I, my profile picture looks like this. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. And Jason, thank you so much again for joining us. To the listeners at home, you can find So You Had to Build a Time Machine in audiobook, ebook, and print formats on our website, camcatbooks.com. You can find CamCat Unwrapped on all major podcasting platforms, or you can watch us on our YouTube channel, CamCat Unwrapped. And make sure you follow us on social media at CamCat Books. Thank you so much for tuning in and unwrapping another one of our books to live in with me. My name's Jess, and I'll see you all next time here on CamCat Unwrapped.